the written narratives to a thematic analysis of those narratives to going back to the data to fill it in even a bit of reshaping of the 2000 word narrative to make it fit into that particular chapter so it's a back and forth um, reshaping of the, the project as you go along okay are there any any questions at this point before we move on to look a little bit more closely at max You had mentioned at the very beginning that when the narratives are written, there are some that wrote in more flowery style, yeah. and some that wrote in more clinical style. How did you, like, or, or did you not, it became not that important to equalize it and kind of really? Okay, so that was just, we chose one case uh, to do that. And then, then we, um, having, once we looked at all of those, there was one that was, that was more or less what we thought they should look like. So we said, let's try and go with that one. And we then tried to write a little bit more like that. We all tried to merge with that one as much as possible. Um, we also looked at similar narratives that had been written with in, 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 in other studies, and that they looked more like like that one. So there's a bit of a calibration across the, the different exactly, studies. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to say once you read the narrative um, that this bit of the narrative. Where did that come from? Uh, from this bit of the interview. We wanted to show the evidence for where the, where the, 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 where the, the details in the narrative came from, um, as far as possible. Because, of course, this is a researcher writing it, so some of your interpretation comes in as well. But as far as possible, to base it on, on, on what's there in the data. What made you, as a team, decide to rewrite the, or write the narratives yourselves, as opposed to perhaps getting the participants to... I thought you were going to ask that question, because that's usually the first question. Yeah. So that, that's, um, that's, a, that's a very good one. So um, there were a number of reasons why we decided to write the narratives ourselves. Um, the main one is that the participants aren't really busy students. <laughs> Um, and to ask them then to write a composition <laughs> based on data that they've, it's just a lot to ask them. They're already doing two interviews and they met with us for the interviews and then they had to review the narrative and meet with them. It was asking them a lot and we just thought that would be asking them too much. Um, another reason was that their, um, their writing proficiency um, was not advanced enough to be able to produce the type of narratives that we wanted. Um, and writing those narratives is an accepted narrative inquiry approach for writing as, as analysis. And researchers do it all the time. And so it's a common narrative inquiry practice, right? Um, and so it was something that we, we committed to ourselves as researchers. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my question is actually just now you you just now you mentioned that you have all the set of data for all the case studies there. Yeah. You have a pre-journey interview and yeah. it, everybody has a set. And then you mentioned that you come up with a, a two thousand word yeah. summary of it. No, don't come up. A lot of hard work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my question is exact. My yeah, my question is is exactly about that. Could you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit? how this process was done, yeah. like from all the data okay, and yeah. come up so with I'll this. So I'll tell you how I did it. I, had, I printed out the interviews and I had for each one person. So I'd have the interviews printed out next to me and I would go through them and I'd keep in mind, okay, what, what are we focusing on here? What's the research question? You know, what's the aim of the study? What's the research question? And I'd go through <clears throat> all the, the interview data, you know, substantial pages. I'd go through all of that. And then I thought, well, because there's a lot in there that's not going to come in the narrative, because it's not part of what we wanted. So I need to figure out what do I want in my narrative, and I'd go through it, and I would take the chunks, and I'd put them into a narrative, uh, just chunks, and then I'd put them into my own words. So I'd write them into my own words. Um, and sometimes the words of the participants were so nice, I would keep those in as quotes. Mm -hmm. 
So I integrated my, my writing with the nice quotes from the interviews. So that's how I, that's how I came up with mine. Yeah. And, and, and you read it again, and then you read that, you do it a couple of times to make sure you get it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then the worst thing is sharing when you're with the team and you share it to the others, and what are they going to think, you know? So, but, but it's a good practice working, it's very interesting working with a team. But Steve, and then. Yeah, so um, we had a similar question this morning, and it's about this idea of whose story is it anyway? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great minds think alike, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea that, um, yeah. Are you appropriating someone yeah. else's story, someone else's narrative? And in the contact zones, from the original text through the changes in the different genres to the final academic text, and you're even, you even said you summarize some of their original text. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so the meaning, the interpretation changes in those different contact zones. Yeah? So how do you deal with that as a narrative yeah. acquirer? Okay. Because it, I would, I would, I believe in these postmodern texts where we weave in our reflections and the data. But I personally wouldn't write my own narrative and then bring in theirs as quotations or paraphrases. Yeah. I would do it a different way. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So how would you do it? Oh, okay. I, I would um, do it in. I would kind. Of, I try to aim for a, a flow from typical academic text to maybe some personal reflection of if I was either what I'm doing now as I am, um, I don't know, analyzing the data, retrospective field notes, but often my narratives I'm with the participants doing it. So that's that, that's one of the different issues. Mm -hmm. I assume you weren't with them, yeah, in these places. Uh, no, 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 no. Well, the next one was, because yeah. I, I'll talk about him next. So yeah, I would have these three have academic texts, my personal reflection as a researcher, and the impact participant voices. Mm. And I would kind of weave in and out of them separately. Yeah. That, that's how I do well, it. Well, there are different ways, yeah, yeah. There are, absolutely, there are different ways of doing it. Um, so, in, so what is your original It was question? in terms of like, whose story is it? Oh, whose story is it? Because of yeah. course we always appropriate, yeah? That's right. So, to some degree. I mean, it's it's their story, but it's, uh, it's a shared story at the same time. And um, what, what we were doing was um, that narrative knowledge I was talking about yeah. in the telling of the, because if you looked at the interview, there are no stories in the interviews. So from a narrative perspective, there was very little in the interview where you could say, oh, that's an interesting story. Um, there were often just one sentence, two sentence replies to questions. Uh, even though we tried to open it up, there were very few longer responses. So there were mainly, Except for someone like Max, who was English proficiency was very high, he, you know, he could, could stop stop me talking at all. So, um, so um, yeah. So there was very little actual story in the interviews itself. A lot of short bits and pieces. So we tried um, in the writing of the narrative to to focus on what our research aim was. Number one, to focus on the research aim. Um, and to be faithful to the experiences as told to us by the participants. So the participants shared with us their, story, their stories, their imagined stories before they left, and then their stories of actual experience. And we tried to be as faithful to that as possible. And one way of, of bringing their voices more loudly into the narrative was to include their quotes as much as possible. You saw in the example I gave, there were a few, not that many, but there were a few. So, um, so yes, it becomes a shared, a shared story. It's their story told, it's me interpreting their story, and then it's me retelling it from my researcher perspective. And I'm not pretending otherwise. I mean, this is me interpreting as a researcher and retelling it as, as a researcher. I'm not pretending that's them telling the story, or I'm not, I'm not claiming altogether that it's my story. Uh, it's definitely their story through me retelling it. And that was just the design of the study that the team agreed to. Right? There are many different approaches, including the one, the one you've um, just mentioned. Um, in, a, in a recent study I published uh, with a teacher, and I was looking at teacher identity, TESOL Courtney, that was published in 2016. What I did based on also interview data, I, um, 
I did what I call a short story analysis. And I took up extracts of her interview data in short, in a story form. And then I did a short story analysis of her short story. And then when I finished the analysis, maybe two pages, I sent her the story and the analysis. And then she wrote back what her response to my analysis. And then in the article, I included her response to my analysis. So it's got like multi-layered interpretation. Firstly, her story where she's narrative knowledge and she's making meaning of her experience. Then I interpret that experience um, through my analysis of it. And then she responds to my analysis. And sometimes I'm not always agreeing, actually, but responding to my analysis, which is then included in the text, in the article itself. Right? So it's a, a nice way of, of mixing the, the different responses. I was just going to ask that question. I wonder, do you finish your know, research and Yes, we did. Yes. Okay. And yes. then did they respond to that? As Mostly, well? yes. And they would say things like, um, uh, you know, please don't put that in, or that's not right. Use this word instead. And so there were some corrections that we then made changes. Yeah. I'm just wondering. It would be interesting to find out whether your interpretation of their story is shared with them. <coughs> turns out they reinterpreted their own story because of your story. Oh, I think so they would. I think they would. There would be a circular kind of, yeah. Yeah. so-called hermeneutic circle. Right? That's right. Going back and yeah. Because this kind of experience is reinterpreted, reconstructed, and yeah. re-experienced. Yeah, almost. absolutely. Yeah. That's what narrative, they're telling stories over and over again. When we tell stories over and over again, things change. But I mean, you've got to, yeah, yes. absolutely, yeah. Um, my question actually relates to both Cindy and, and Steve's yeah. question in relation to the notion of translation and, you know, the notion of translating uh, oh, a yeah. story, yeah, translation yeah. of the embodiment, but also even the literal translation in terms of, I noticed um, you said that the interviews were actually in Cantonese. Yes. And so, I mean, I think a great example was Max trying to tell you know, no, was in English. He was in English. Oh, his was in English. Okay, yeah, yeah. but this idea, however, he's talking about how he's translating things from Cantonese, and it didn't go over as well because there's a different. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it kind of makes me think about the implications for when we do narrative research, yeah. and this is, and there's no right or wrong answer, but I'd be interested to hear what your take on it is. Yeah. Um, you know, considering that some of the study abroad students seem to have. You know, if they were doing post secondary in, in New Zealand, the assumption is they would have a fairly decent level of you know English yes. education. Yes. So I guess the question is to what what levels then would would make it useful to in some ways try to ask them to do their um, their interviews in English if the researcher themselves speaks English? Because I guess I'm wondering in some ways. When we say what you were saying, I'm taking aspects of their story, technically it's not, arguably some could say it's not their story, it's your RA's story. Because in translating it, there are nuances that oh, I yeah, assume yeah, that, yeah. They, you know what I mean? So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, and it's not an art because this is, these are the paradoxes, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess the question is at what point does does would you feel it might be better or more I hate the word accurate or whatever but you know <laughs> to actually ask students to try to speak their second language mm. that you know that you as a researcher are able to you know what I mean where yeah. it might not be a straight translation but in some ways it doesn't go through multiple levels of mediation through an RA and then through you and then through back to the student, which is another, you know what I mean? Just yeah. kind of mitigate, yeah. just you have to think back on that. I mean, that's interesting, because we can take it to, if you want to go even further, even, you know, telling stories in your own first language, they linguistic limitations. I mean, because your story is a, is, a, is a story of experience, right? And the experience is the thing that actually happened. And as a researcher, you can never, you can never, account for that. You can never 
ever describe that or explain that. That's happened. That's in the, the whole, how do you actually get to the thing that actually happened? Well, you can never. The only way you can get it is through some visual data or some linguistic data and so on. And then there the limitations begin already. Right, because then you know, in terms of describing what happened in language, whether it's first language or second language or language X, whatever the case may be, there are those limitations. And whichever route you choose, uh, there, there are further limitations with translation or not translation, and then and then who are they telling it to? So because those students were talking to a, a Cantonese speaking RA, you know, as opposed to talking to me, a professor, um, the researcher. It may be quite different yet again. So, you know, we, it's all complicated. <laughs> so you have, so to, no answer. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> you have to decide yeah. uh, what... I said it's, the answer is in providing all these uh, rich okay. contextual information. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, you have to do, you have to go with what's feasible uh, in, in terms of um, the, the participants, the researcher, and the funding, and the, con the contextual variables, and the aim of the study, it's all of those things come together, you know? And so, yeah, there's never an easy way out. Yeah. 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 But I guess uh, one thing we, we could do when we do this is to um, make explicit the kind of uh, <coughs> analyzing frames, yes. because you're looking at all these uh, so-called war data, but you have a list of research questions in front of you, and then basically you are, uh, cooking up a story. <laughs> <laughs> but but this cooking everybody's cooking up a yes, story right. anyway. Yes. So but just tell, but just tell people what recipes I have followed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the ingredients. You only have good ingredients. Yeah. To I have the ingredients, I also have a recipe. I just make it explicit. You gotta make it explicit. Yeah. Like exactly <laughs> what you do. Yeah. yeah. yeah similar in, if, if anything it almost serves as a critique to you know, things that we imagine are more accurate or more objective, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that that narrative that you showed us from Max, that reconstructed narrative, looks very similar to any kind of introduction that we write in a case study or anything like mm -hmm. that. Whether we acknowledge it as a narrative or an mm -hmm. objective mm -hmm. description. Right? Yeah. So. Okay, so let, let, let's move on. Um, Okay, well, I, we can go quite quite quickly on this good interaction. So, um, Jane Jackson, who uh, was at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, she points out that most of the study abroad research on L2 and intercultural learning focuses on students who take language courses in the host country. And she says, far fewer stu studies explore the L2 use and development of non-language specialists in L2 contexts, especially those with an advanced level of proficiency. Um, and also uh, adds that uh, including those who do coursework in a second language with English being the most common medium of instruction. So she says that fewer studies tend to focus on study abroad students who are advanced speakers of the L2 who go to study um, through the medium of their second language. Uh, and this is the case with Max. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about Max. He was a, he was a participant in the big study. Um, he, as I said, he was, when he came to New Zealand, he was in his early 20s. He came to do a BA in media studies and psychology. He had studied for one year at a university in Hong Kong already. He was very much into sports. Um, and he worked as a DJ on a Chinese radio station in Auckland after a while when he'd been there. I like to describe him as a cool dude. He, you know, he had like a spiky hair, and he had a jean the whole thing. Every time I saw him, he looked like a completely different person. Um, he, after he finished, he returned to Hong Kong to do a master's in communications. Um, he had various internships and jobs in sports media and on TV in Hong Kong. Um, and he eventually got a, a full-time job with uh, the Hong Kong Cricket, Cricket Association and then with the Hong Kong Rugby Union, um, doing uh, media work, doing um, events organizing, mainly working with expats, uh, because those two sports are associated with expats in Hong Kong, right? Mainly from uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Scotland, Wales, England, um, and the players are mainly from uh, South, A South Asia, and, um, and so there's a lot of communication with English. 
Um, my first interview with him, because he was part of the, the big study and he came to New Zealand, so I was the one who interviewed him, was at the start of his first year in March 2010. 2010, right? And then the post-departure, because we were only limit, we were limiting the, the, the study to one year's data, was at the end of his first year. So at the end of his first year, beginning of the second year, I did the second interview with him. So the April 2011. And he completed his degree in mid-2011. So he worked, he studied summer schools and he finished quite early. So he, he did two and a half year, two and a half, going on three years. He then uh, did an internship for a month and then he returned to Hong Kong. Um, and then three years later, after he finished, I found myself in Hong Kong and I thought, I wonder how Max is doing. And I contacted him and we went out for lunch and so I did a follow-up interview, a post-sojourn to see how he was doing, to see whether the study abroad experience had uh, any lasting effects, you know, whether there'd been uh, his second language identity or his multilingual identity, um, there had been any further changes after being back in Hong Kong for, um, you know, uh, a further three years post degree. So that was that was the data that I collected. Um, at the beginning of his first year, so in the first interview, he said, and I want some change in my life, and I want to be more independent because I can get away from my parents and my close friends as well. So he was interested in that, remember on the model, on the L2 mediated personal development. He, his, he was, his English proficiency was, was very high, um, although there were limitations and that's another day, but he was interested in personal growth, in personal development, as he said there. He said, because I have been relying on my parents for the past 20 years, when I go back, I will definitely become more independent and make decisions of myself. And yet, so he's, he's, he's now imagining his identity after study abroad. I will be more independent. Okay, I'll, I'll make decisions myself here. Yeah. Okay, remember this. Just remember this. <laughs> and then one year later, he says, I would say it's uh, the first year study abroad, surprisingly fruitful and surprisingly beneficial to my whole life because I didn't expect that I will uh, develop as much as a person. Okay. Because it's, I guess it's because I'm away from my teenage years. So he's saying, yeah, because I'm growing up. I'm, I'm growing up, yeah. Yeah, so I thought I was like at another stage already before I came, but now I feel like I changed a lot after this year. So that is quite a surprise for me. So he has felt after one year that the study abroad has helped him to mature, to gain a bit more independence, to develop as a person, right? Okay, so have a look at the handout here. Now, this was four years later, in 2016, where I go to Hong Kong and I meet Max and we go out for lunch. And we have a lovely long lunch, a lovely long interview, and this is um, a short story which I've extracted, a short story which I've extracted from the interview. Now this is right back in Hong Kong. He says, and I ask him, you know, what's it like those, those first few months when you got back? It's quite long, but it goes quickly when I read it. He said, it's very interesting. Um, there were two impressive phenomena that I experienced. The first one is I had to move back to my family. <laughs> because it's not, it's obviously, I basically moved out for like around two and a half years and staying with my parents and now staying with his parents. And it's very different because you get all the freedom in the world when you're abroad and he laughs. And he's still a little bit of getting used to, he says, now that he's back. Not just in telling the story. He's in New Zealand, then he's in Hong Kong. Then he's in New Zealand, then he's in Hong Kong. Okay? So, line eight. And it's still a little bit of getting used to now that I'm back. And secondly, just Hong Kong as a society to live in. It's very different. It's like the pace is so like how people talk, how people socialize. It's very different. So it definitely took me more than a few months to adjust myself. And especially when I came back and I did the postgraduate course in this university. Most of them were actually mainland students. It's a funny phenomenon in Hong Kong, especially in the postgraduate level. 80% of the students, they are from the mainland. So it's the third different kind, 
of social circumstance I encountered. So first it was New Zealand, and then I come back to Hong Kong, and then I have to socialize with the mainland students, <laughs> which is a very new experience for me. So another phase for me to get used to it. So, um, but I think for the first few months, I was still able to maintain my lifestyle, my New Zealand lifestyle. And I brought it back to Hong Kong. But it only stayed for like the first half year. <laughs> what are some examples? For example, when I was staying in a homestay of study abroad, I bought an old bicycle and I rode it like every Sunday, early morning, like at five, before sunrise. And then I was able to, I don't have a bike anymore, now in Hong Kong, right? But I went for a job, or something like that, at like early Sunday morning. It's like a routine that I developed back in New Zealand. Then I kept doing it for like half a year, and then I stopped. That's like, that's like the climate, that's the, 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 the crux of the story. Like, and then I stopped. <laughs> and also, and not just the behavioral routines, it's all about how I do things and how I think. Because in New Zealand, I had to do everything by myself. I had to depend on myself. And back here, because my mom is a housewife, and I can go back to my safe haven. And then I can depend on her again. Like all the little things in the daily routine, the daily life, and so that I said, the food and everything was taken care of. Yeah, yeah. And so like, after half a year now, I went back to my old self, basically. Which is terrible. <laughs> I think of myself because it's like, oh, I'm back to when I was a high school kid or something like that. And so the mentality was also changing, like back to before I went to New Zealand. So yeah, that was quite an interesting transformation. The transformation is not the study abroad transformation, the post sojourn transformation. But let's have a look at the story a little more closely. Okay, that's the story. Um, Short story analysis is a way of focusing more systematically on the content of the story and also on the context in which that content of the experience unfolds in life, in, in your life of the story. Um, so, in fact, I wrote an article which was published in System about Max. It was a methodological article. Investigating Multilingual Identity in Study Abroad Context, a short story analysis. So the article is about short story analysis, but it's focusing on two or three of Max's short stories. This one's not included, there's some other ones. Um, so if you're interested in there, further references to short story analysis. But the way it works very simply is that you go through the short story and you ask three content questions. Who is in the story? Where is, does the action of the story take place? And when? So you've got who, where, and when. Three questions. You go line by line and you say who, who is in the story? How do they relate to each other? How do they position themselves? Where? And where does things happen? And when? And then you look at the context of the story. So story with small letters, story with a capital S, and story in capital letters. So it just simply means moving out, the, uh, looking at the context of the story. So not just uh, Max with his family, but rather Max in, in um, Hong Kong society, right? And moving out, but not only Max in Hong Kong society, but Max as a citizen of Hong Kong, and Max as a study abroad student in New Zealand and looking at the connection between those countries. So you've got big New Zealand. You've got um, the, 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 the ideological understandings of what study abroad is, what international education is, and um, how identity changes, intercultural changes take place through study abroad. They're big questions, big discourses, right? Um, so it's moving out to the, to the big macro understandings, macro context, but also the meso, you know, in the neighborhood, if you want to take a physical example, and the micro in the family apartment. So, um, but also sort of temporal, like um, on a macro level, being in New Zealand for three years, um, and then uh, on the meso level, being back for six months, and then on the micro level, just uh, what happens in one day or something. So, you know, looking at these 
context. And the important thing in the analysis is not only to make to interpret the story on the micro level. Because if you interpret the story only on the micro level, you're going to miss out on one of the meanings of the story. You've got to look at what's going on on the macro level as well. Um, and often on the macro level, that's where you become a little bit uncomfortable in your interpretations because you find things that you may not always want to find. Mm -hmm. Things that are hard to make sense of. Questions that are hard to answer. Um, and so that, but you've got to push yourself as a researcher to move out to those macro level. Um, you know, things that, are, things that are ideological, things that may be political. And if you think about what's going on in Hong Kong right now, some of those larger ideological issues uh, impact on Max's life. And he, he, he doesn't want to live there anymore. He wants to move out of Hong Kong. I just recently spoke to him. So where he is now as a study abroad student, um, living right now, he's in a very uncomfortable position in his own personal life. So I can't just interpret it, oh, he's got a job here in Hong Kong, or he's got a job there. There are much bigger issues to interpret his post-sojourn study abroad life, right? So um, that's why this model is just a reminder of what to consider when doing the analysis of the short story, to think of all of it, to ask all of these questions. Just for example, we can zip through this. If you ask about who, you know, with the story in front of you, you've got Max, um, move back to my family in line four. So there is, um, that's his family in Hong Kong. Staying with my parents, Hong Kong society. Now we've got a, a slightly wider level. People in Hong Kong, mainland students. That's another whole identity experience for him. He's now interacting with a third group of people, he says. 80% um, postgraduate students, mainland students, housewife mom. That is a more micro level relationship that he has. So it's just, that's why I've got these arrows. They're moving inwards and outwards and backwards and forwards in terms of his relationships with others, the positions, um, he, how he positions himself with other people in this narrative. And to depend on her again, that's a nice relationship um, uh, uh, phrase that he uses. Okay? So, there's a lot of people in that story. You just think, oh, it's Max and, you know, he's in Hong Kong. But if you look at it carefully, and when you look at where, look at all the references to place. I won't go through these, but there are so many references to place. You've got to get back to Hong Kong, macro, family home. Why is he in the family home? Who knows Hong Kong? Why, why is he in the family home? It's so congested. Like living in a shoebox. Yeah, but, but why do you think he chose to go back to his family home? It's too expensive. expensive. Yeah, he's a study abroad student. How's he in your foreign department? Of course he's going to stay with his family, right? So there are economic reasons why he's living where he is. And that relates to his identity, his post sojourn study abroad identity. That's where he has to stay. He's got no choice. He moved out to go to New Zealand, but then he moved back in with his parents. So you look at each reference to, to where he is, and then you say, how do these references relate to each other and relate to the bigger story and relate to the who? So you make connections. Um, so it's not just a straightforward thematic analysis. It's much more focusing on the content. And you'll see it moves out, mainland China, New Zealand, and then he's got the safe haven micro with the family. And then he's got the high school. He's like a high school kid relating to the past. And then before New Zealand, past, present, future, constant moving back and forth in terms of place and also in terms of when. And again, look at all the references, specific references to, to time. Uh, and this is obviously, a, you know, a temporal dimension is so important in narrative. So the first few months, then two and a half years, much bigger. When you're abroad, more than a few months, when you come back, the first phase, constant reference. The point is not just to list them, but to say why they're significant and how these references relate to each other. And we can talk about this forever, but I just want to show you um, how methodical it is to work systematically through that, write all this down on a piece of paper and say, okay, how does all this fit together with the where's and with the who's? Um, also keeping in mind the story, story, story context. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a really useful way of doing a narrative short story analysis. 
Okay, so just to, um, to summarize quickly before I show you a couple more things. Um, so if we look at Max's identity, he, on study abroad, uh, he was the independent study abroad student. Like he said, he had more, more independence um, in lines 37, 38. That's, that's what he says. Post sojourn, he had a, a postgraduate student identity, which was fine. A number of his other identities were almost the same as his pre-study abroad identities, such as being a dependent son, a Hong Kong resident, my old self, the high school kid. So these are almost like his pre-study abroad <coughs> identities. And you almost think, well, that's a bit sad, actually. Like, uh, you know, uh, was it worth it? Yeah, it was two and a half years. But of course, this is only one short story, right? There's a lot of other stuff going on in his life. For example, he had an internship and he was really successful. The work he was doing, he was really good. Um, he um, was a media worker and doing fantastic. In fact, now he freelances, he owns a media company. So he's done really well, right? Um, he was a cricket enthusiast, a cricket expert. He became a, a cricket a commentator. He knew what he was doing. He was referred to as the study abroad guy. Go ask the study abroad guy, because his English was so good. So he's got all these other identities that, um, you know, are not part of the story you've just seen. He's a good English speaker, very high level proficiency English speaker. As an MA graduate, he completed his graduate qualification. Very good basketball player. He was going to play basketball after the lunch we had. Um, he imagined himself as a foreign correspondent or working in, uh, you know, CNN or Fox Sport or something. Um, and he also didn't imagine himself uh, as an immigrant to New Zealand, maybe returning to New Zealand one day and, and living and working there. So that, 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 just to remind you that we just looked at one short story, but there are other stories and other identities as well. So they can't be too narrow focused. But what happened was interesting. Um, almost two years later, what I did was I sent him the story that you got. And what I did was, um, as you can see, it's a bit hard to see, but on the, this right hand side here, you know, with the, the MS Word in the comments, I highlighted some text like this, and then I asked some questions about it. So from the short story, so that I had to move back with my family. The question one, are you still with your family? So I'm trying to get an update, right? And question two, how do you feel about your current living arrangements? And then this bit here, just Hong Kong as a society to live in, I said, um, do you still make comparisons of Hong Kong society and New Zealand society? Do you still think of New Zealand in your in your day-to-day -day living? What role does English play in your life now in Hong Kong? Do you think your time in New Zealand had an influence on this? And then I asked um, how many? 17 questions based on that short story. Um, and so I sent him the short story text with those list of questions. And then in a Word document, he answered the questions and sent me a few pages where he gave me an update on those questions. So it was really interesting for me just to keep in touch, to keep the narrative going. Um, I haven't done anything with this yet. I haven't written, but I'll write about it for one day. So I've got an update of, of the story. And, you know, I won't go through these, but these are some of the some of the updated things, you know, still living with the family. So this was, you know, a couple of years later, 2016. Uh, he, life comparison with New Zealand is less frequent now than it used to be. But he moved to a job at the rugby union. And his immediate boss and many colleagues are Kiwi from New Zealand. Uh, more than half the colleagues are expats. And so English is about 70, 30, 70 percent English, 30 percent Chinese. Uh, English usage in New Zealand prepared him for his daily communications nowadays at work. So he's still making connections, his experience of learning English and so on. Um, and uh, he did so and so on. You know, he worked in expat, he's expat focused, so he works in a, a work environment with expats, so he's using English a lot. Um, my life right now is pretty much work focused, which I find. Trying, at this point, he was trying to start his own business. Um, and, and so he can, there were many more. These are just a few selections from all his answers, right? Um, 
And then in June this year, Angel and I were at a, at a conference in Hong Kong. And the day before the conference, I phoned him, said, how about lunch? He said, yes. So we went and had lunch. And um, we had a nice long lunch. And we had a long interview over lunch. So in June this year, um, we, we, we caught up. But this, and I'm still transcribing the interview. But um, this bit was really interesting that he said. And we were, we were talking about his connection uh, with English and New Zealand. And um, he said, the way of speaking, that's one thing that I learned in New Zealand. But I think this is really insightful, what he says about, about English and his connection with New Zealand. That's one thing that I learned in New Zealand. But the more important thing is the culture, the whole culture, the Western culture. Because I was definitely immersed into the culture. Like the fact that I got to work in cricket and rugby here in Hong Kong is due to my time in New Zealand. Like not necessarily the direct contact with the sport, but the way of thinking and the way of presenting yourself, the way of working, it makes me more approachable when I interview for those jobs. There's a second part to this. But you can see he is, when he's talking about English, he is saying there's much more than just English. There's a way of, um, and it's not only culture too, but there's a way of, of, of being yourself, your, who you are, your identity, right? So he's time, this, this post sojourn, uh, 2019, he left 2012, so seven years later, there's still that connection with New Zealand, he's still there in terms of his identity. And as he explains, um, and this is when he's applying for jobs. So. He, when he first got back to Hong Kong, he worked in the cricket union, then he worked as a media, then he worked in the rugby union as an events manager, and then he felt um, he could become a freelancer in a media company that he set up. Um, he said, I'm, I'm not married, I'm staying at home, I don't have to worry about anything, I can take a chance, right? So he started to develop this company. Um, and so, but he's applying, he still applies for jobs and, and so on. But then he goes on, because obviously the management who are the interviewers, they're Australians, they're Kiwis, they're Scottish, and they're working in the sports industry. So I think compared to other candidates who are completely local, I had the advantage of speaking their language. He doesn't mean that English, he's speaking their language. And when I say language, not just the superficial English language, but the whole context, culture, everything. So I got along with them very well. And I think that's mostly due to my experience in New Zealand. So it's quite profound actually, I think, in a way. He's making um, sense of his identity and how he can perform his identity in his work, in his interaction with his expats, and particularly when he goes and job interviews, right, and uh, working with these people in his, in his work environment, which is very expat heavy work environment for the type of sports that he's, that he's interested in. I just wanted to um, perhaps end with this and say that, you know, identities are foregrounded and backgrounded. So our identities aren't stable and fixed, but we have a foregrounding and backgrounding our identity, depending on who we're interacting with and who we're mixing with. Them. Um, and they change the short term and over time, and I think we've seen that with Max, um, discursively in social interaction and in material interaction with spaces, places, and objects. Um, and I think with Max we see that in different places, with different people, uh, in different organizations, different things that he does, media companies, and so on. We see his post sojourn identity shifting and changing and reshaping itself, but still maintaining traces of his study abroad experience um, in, in New Zealand. So that's where I'm at with that, the, the study here. Um, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
thank you very much for your talk. So I actually did a short story analysis for um, identity course by taught by Bonnie Norton at UBC, yeah. and I actually used the framework, yeah. and I found it very practical and uh, approachable for as a as myself as a NMA student who's yeah. new to the field. And at the same time, I had a kind of challenges separating out the time and space because they are so interconnected. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Plus, my actually analysis ended up like being a kind of laundry list of what happened. So I would just wonder if you could possibly provide us with some practical tips for like how to deal with place and the like, where and when aspect plus okay. how. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's something I'm. I'm um, it's, a, it's, a it's a dilemma I've faced as well. So. In the um, in that 2016 article uh, in Teacher in, yeah, uh, on, on, on Teacher Identity, I don't know if you've seen it. I had um, when I did a short story analysis, I did who, then I did where, then I did when, and then I found by the time I got to when, I was repeating myself <laughs> because yeah. you know I was saying the same things that sort of who, where, and when, and for who, where, and when, I was doing the three levels of context. Um, in the analysis, the actual data analysis, I listed everything mechanically, systematically, but when writing it up, I found I started to repeat myself. And so by the time I got to when, it was a short section, and who was very long. Mm -hmm. So when I did Max's article in System, that other one, I combined them. Mm -hmm. I did who, where, and when together. And so, um, I mean, I analyzed them separately, but I wrote it up together. Uh -huh. And then when there was a reference to who, I put in brackets and I put who in italics. And then if it was a reference to when, I, in brackets I put when in italics. Mm -hmm. Or if it was an obvious reference to a macro context, I put story in capitals in italics. So instead of breaking it up into sections, mm -hmm. I just wrote an analysis of the story and made reference to the different aspects uh -huh. of the model referring to my uh, my systematic analysis that I did earlier. So I've done it in those two different ways. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, but again, the, the, the different things you can do with that model. So I've got a few PhD students trying to use it in a PhD dissertation, which is a big document, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to an article, a journal article, that's fabulous. Because you go, it's easy, it's short. But one of the PhD students, she, only used the story, story, story for her discussion chapter. Mm -hmm. So she had, for her findings chapters, she used a theoretical model. This is a first year, first year PhD student's experiences. And so she used a, um, a model from higher education. And the four findings, three findings chapters mm -hmm. used different aspects of the theoretical model. And within each chapter, she told stories of the people's experiences, the participants' experience, 10 of them, in relation to that theory. And then in the discussion chapter, she brought it all together by, story, by using story, story, story as a framework. Mm -hmm. So she discussed their narratives through looking at story, their micro learnings, and then their meso, and then their macro. So she, you can play around with it. I, I'm not prescriptive on how it's used at all. And um, I think you can you know, use different aspects of it. Yeah, thank you very much. And I want you to talk about the scale, scalar analysis, the different mm. time scales, the different spatial scales. I just see the scale, scales is very much prominent for analysis. Yeah. I've used it very simply as um, scales referring to with the story, 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 just in terms of um, moving like the, the, the sort of spatial scales um, and, and, and temporal scales in terms of time, looking over time. Uh, again, uh, in interpreting um, any, any experience, that experience doesn't only take place just at that time, but it takes place, if there's, there's a historical, um, in historical time, but also future, especially with study abroad. There's imagining and desires and emotions related to the future. And so, um, uh, with scales, that's, that's the way I'm using it on a temporal measure, and in terms of space, um, with study abroad, it's not just one person moving from this university to that one, but you're moving from one nation to another nation, and, 
and interpreting it on those sort of scales as well, so the spatial scales in that in that sense, with the with the ideologies and the histories that go along with those nations, um, if you want to talk about nations, or as opposed to uh, sort of um, you know geopolitical contexts in a way. I noticed that you've you've got obviously time and space in there, but there's a, a focus in, in terms of materiality as well, like embodied identity, objects, things like that. Is that something that you're paying more analytic attention to, or has that always been there? Or? Yeah, I you know um, not so much with with Max, although there are interesting things looking like you know when he says he went for his bicycle ride, for example, and then he gave that up and went jogging instead. So, you know, material objects. I mean, with teachers and that, there's a lot of interesting research done, you know, Kalim Tui and so on, other very interesting stuff. But even in that short story, he makes reference to particular objects, you know, material objects and things. Um, I mean, I guess I, I would bring that into my, into my where, into my places. But where I don't only necessarily mean place, but place and things. Yeah. Um, and I think, as I said, the fact that he said he stopped riding his bicycle was quite symbolic in that story, because he sort of stopped being the study abroad guy. And it's almost like a, a symbolic end to that, and now he's back, you know. I mean, of course, I've made the argument, the whole argument today is that he didn't, in fact, stop being the study abroad guy. But in that story, it appears like he had been. Um, so I haven't done that much research myself on, on, on materiality. That's not something I do when it comes up, I, I do look at it. Um, but uh, I haven't done that much actually. Yeah. There's just a, a comment about you asking about tips, yeah, about how you, you know, these different this scalar nexus, you know, fitting with all the different levels. And um, it just, I, I do something similar with data like that, but I look at it um, with, with students like this who are sort of in transitional, transnational. I look at it in terms of identities of there, identities of here, oh, yeah. identities of here and there, and identities of neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very similar to yeah. what you're describing, but it's just a slightly different focus. And, and I think the important thing is to understand the concept of space yeah. and movement between space, and that it's mm -hmm. impossible to I don't know, in the world today, it's impossible to really categorize yeah. all of these things in, so, in such a discrete way. So you need the neither here nor there, and the here and there. That's right. Well. And, that's right. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and that's really sort of the overlap between yeah. those different layers that you're talking about. Yeah, so what I was trying to capture one with this was that it, you're not just there, right? But it's, it's constant sequences of places moving back and forth, not only in real time, but in, in your imagination and in your thinking and in how you interpret your, your experience. It's this constant moving, you know. Um, I think that's right, yeah. Um, but I, with, the, with the short story analysis, all I'm saying, really, is that it's a way to get into some data. Um, instead of just looking at it and saying, oh, that's a theme, that's a theme, this is interesting. It's just a, some systematic way to get started. And then once you're in there, you know, be creative, do different things. As I, yeah, blur the lines, do whatever you want to, but uh, it's just a starting point that I found useful in my own work, and, and others have found useful too. It's just a way to get going, that's all. And on that note, I would like to thank Gary again for really Thank you very much. Those colleagues and friends and classmates who came out of the today, you can get in the click on the links and we will put to that, those up if you need this weekend. Um, and also the interview. Uh, we will have an interview with Gary um, following, following up.